respect for concentration. It's interesting that of the different factors in the path, virtue, concentration, and discernment, the Buddha singled out concentration as something worthy of respect. At one point he called it the heart of the path. And yet one of the reasons he needs to remind us to respect it is it's something we tend to overlook, something we tend to step on. Those little moments of stillness in the mind, we tend to ignore them. We don't even pay much attention to them. We're ignorant of them. We're so much more interested in running after things, thinking about this, thinking about that, looking at this, looking at that, getting the mind all stirred up, and yet ignoring the little moments of stillness between those flashes of what basically comes down to disturbance in the mind. We see the disturbance as interesting and the stillness as boring, and so we keep running after whatever flashes in holds promise to look interesting. And you look at it for a while and you realize there's not much there. So you drop that, the mind goes still for a second, then you move to something else. There's little moments of stillness so much in the background that we hardly even see them. And yet it's these moments of stillness that we want to work with. Without these moments of stillness, for one thing, the mind would go crazy, wouldn't have any rest at all. And secondly, if you're going to develop stronger concentration, you've got to start with these little moments, start connecting them up. Resist the, intention, the, the temptation to go running after any new disturbance that comes into the mind. Make up your mind, you're going to stay right here with the breath. The breath is not that colorful an object, at least when you look at it on the surface. You find, though, as you get to know it more and more, that like concentration, the more you spend time with it, the more it has to offer, the more absorbing it gets. But to get to that state of absorption, you have to start with smaller moments of concentration. Pay attention to them. Look after them. Now John Fuang often used the word brokong in Thai, which literally, it's the word that you would use, say, if a child is trying to walk and you're standing behind it. And you want it to learn how to walk on its own, but you don't want it to fall. And so that you're gently hover around it to make sure it doesn't fall, but at the same time make sure that you're not preventing it from walking on its own. That's the kind of attitude you want to have. <coughs> towards your concentration. And in the beginning, you have to take it on faith that the concentration is going to be a good thing. You read passages in the text, and they're there to give you a sense of inspiration, a sense of rapture permeating the body. The images they give of a spring of water welling up from within a lake. Or lotus is growing in a lake, lake saturated with water from the tips of the roots to the, the tip of the bud. Sounds good. Something you'd like to experience. And the images are attractive for a reason. One, they really are descriptive of the state of concentration. And two, they're there to make you want to go there to remind you that these little states of concentration that seem so unpromising in the beginning, when, when you stitch them together, develop a strength, develop a depth that they don't have otherwise. Then you find that sense of space <laughs> in the mind becomes more and more attractive. The Buddha calls it taking emptiness as your dwelling. Instead of focusing on the figures in the foreground, you focus on the space around them. And you realize that space is a nice space. It's quiet, undisturbed. And there's only this modicum of disturbance, the focusing on the breath or whatever your topic of meditation is. And you let go of all other concerns. And when you do that, you realize how much you carry around, how many burdens you create for yourself unnecessarily. And you also come to appreciate how really good it is to have this nice, still space in the mind that surrounds everything. 
of course, then there comes the desire to want it to be more and more pervasive. Because it's so easy to lose. You've still got those old habits of running out after things that you think are important or think are interesting, think have a lot of value, things you've got to look into, got to look after all the time. And the Buddha gives you tools for realizing how those things really aren't worth all that much worry, aren't worth all that much care. They're not worth burdening down the mind. But it's an interesting point that in the practice he doesn't have you look at those things in that point of view until you really do realize that you've got something better. You've got this state of concentration. Some people start analyzing things in terms of their impermanence or the, the stress or suffering inherent in them or the fact that they're not really you, yours to, to control. And if you don't have the background of the concentration, it gets pretty depressing to think about those things. But if you think of contemplation, what they call the three characteristics, inconstancy, stress, and not-self, if you do it in the context of the concentration, it becomes liberating. You begin to realize that these disturbances in the mind that wipe out the emptiness or create problems in the emptiness or destroy the emptiness, cut through it in the sense of cutting it up in little pieces, when you really look at them, they're not worth all that much care. They're not worth all that much worrying. You don't have to go flowing out after them. It's at that point in the, in the practice of the Buddha has you think about these three characteristics. To see that the things that you were worried about, the things you really held on to so tight, they're pretty empty too. And this is where their emptiness becomes a positive thing, instead of being depressing or nihilistic. It means you don't have to burden yourself down with them. You can live with them in a way that where they don't put any weight on the mind. It's interesting to notice that in the Pali Canon, when the Buddha talks about emptiness, he talks about it in two frameworks. One is this sense of dwelling in emptiness, as the mind gets still and that stillness begins to permeate throughout things, surround things. He calls that dwelling in emptiness. And it's a good thing. There are other passages where he uses the word emptiness, and he talks about how things are empty of self, and empty of self or anything pertaining to self. In other words, they're not yours, and they don't belong to you, and they're not you. And out of context, that sounds kind of negative. The things you used to pin your hopes on, they're not really you or yours. If you, if you take it out of context, it sounds like you're depriving yourself of something, or that these things are negative. But it's not the things that are negative, it's our attachment to them that's a problem. The attachment that keeps destroying our concentrations, destroying the stillness of mind. So when you can see, see things as inconstant, stressful, and empty of self, from the point of view of trying to maintain this dwelling and emptiness, then it all becomes positive and everything begins to connect. You can maintain your state of the spacious sense of the mind at the same time that the things that used to bother you, things that used to weigh you down, they get empty too. So you can live together. So you can live with these things but not be weighed down by them. That's when the two different meanings or two different contexts for emptiness come together in a way that creates freedom for the mind. This pattern is true of all the passages where the Buddha focuses on the negative side of things. There's a passage in the Sutta Nibbāta where he talks about how, he, as a young man, he looked around at the world and he said it was like fish fighting in a small puddle of water. There was only a little puddle of water and all the fish wanted to, to take it over in there, so they're struggling with each other. And there's not enough water for the fish. He said, that's the way the world is. People are constantly struggling, as if there weren't enough in the world to feed everybody, to clothe everybody, to give everybody shelter. It's a constant competition. And everywhere he looked, he said there was everything was laid claim to. There was no spot in the world where you could simply be free. There was no spot in the world where you couldn't be squeezed out by somebody 
gave him a sense of what's called sangwega, it's kind of a dismay, the state of the world. But then he realized that the problem was not in the world, it lay in the heart. That there was an arrow in the heart, he said, and if you can pull that arrow out, then there's no problem. So his description of the world may sound pessimistic, but it's there for a purpose, a positive purpose. And if we didn't see the world as confining, that would indicate that our hearts were small, but our hearts are large. The problem is that we're trying to use the world to fill up the heart, and it's impossible. The heart is a large thing. The only thing that can fill it is the, the sense of emptiness of concentration, the lack of disturbance, the peace, the stillness. They come not only from focusing the mind on a particular object, but also from letting go of attachments. So our problem is that we're trying to fill up this, fill up our minds with the wrong things. We try to fill them up with things, rather than filling them up with the, the space of this peace that can come as we work with the concentration, as we develop discernment. There's another passage where. He, talks about the body in terms of its 32 parts. You take it apart piece by piece, and you look at each piece, and you realize there's nothing really there that you want to get attached to. You've got lungs, you've got liver, you've got intestines, you've got the contents of your intestines all the way down. Many people object that this is a negative way of looking at the body, but the purpose is to free the mind, to give a sense of lightness that you don't have to take such obsessive care of the body. You don't have to be so attached to it. You don't have to regard it as a really valuable possession. It's a useful tool, and it can be very useful in the practice. But when we make it an end in and of itself, we weigh the mind down, burden the mind. So the purpose of this analysis is to free the mind, to give you a sense of lightness. To open the mind back up to that space of concentration. So these ways of looking at the world, which sometimes seem so negative, are actually there for a very positive purpose, to remind ourselves of the happiness that comes, the well-being that comes when we don't confine ourselves to narrow desires, narrow obsessions, when we can free the mind from its straitjacket, that it's imposed on itself, when we can pull out that arrow the arrow of the craving that somehow thinks that we're going to get satisfaction out of the body, satisfaction out of our possessions, satisfaction out of our relationships, satisfaction out of building a nice, coherent philosophy. It's learning to see through those things, to realize that these attachments, these clings, are nothing but confinements of the mind. And when we have the concentration as a counterbalance, and it's, it's easier to make that kind of analysis and not get depressed, because what it does, it opens you back up to stronger and more lasting and more solid and more spacious states of peace in the mind. So at whatever stage you are in the, con in the practice, remember, respect for concentration is what forms the basis for everything else. Appreciation for the stillness of the mind, those little spaces in the mind that may not seem all that impressive in the beginning but can lead to true happiness if you take them seriously, if you treat them with respect. This is a common theme throughout the Buddha's teachings, that little things in the mind which seem pretty unimpressive to begin with, if you pay attention to them, look after them, if you use the John Fung's word, brakong them, can more than repay the effort that's put into developing them. The potential for happiness lies in little unexpected things which may seem unremarkable to begin with, but really show their true colors when you show them respect. It's like those fairy tales where there's a little ugly troll, and everybody looks down on the troll, and it's the, the person who takes time to re show a little respect to the troll, and that's when the troll shows his treasure of gold and gives it to the person who respects him. In the same way, these qualities of the mind, they show their gold when you show them respect. 